Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. This is Score, the podcast. I'm Kenny Holmes alongside Robert Kraft and also Matt Schrader joining us. What's up, gentlemen? Well, I'm waiting for Jordan Bieber to jump in. Is he coming today? Did you send him an email? You haven't given up on him yet? He's he's done. (laughs) Jordan and we I had are, his funeral. Jordan we are Bieber the is biggest no score of the podcast fans. <laughs> uh, we're really excited about our guest today. You may have, se- if you're a if you're a big film music fan, you've probably seen his name on a number of projects. Additional composer, uh, collaboration composer work with Hans Zimmer. Um, but he's gone through the remote control gauntlet, and uh, mm-hmm. this is kind of his breakout year. He's got a big new show on Amazon Prime Video right now, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, starring Donald Glover, um, who also wrote and created the show, so that should be great, and we're going to talk to him about that music. He also has a couple of other big projects on the uh, horizon, Damsel, starring Millie Bobby Brown on Netflix, mm-hmm. Alto Nights, starring Robert De Niro, and then he's doing a Jim Henson documentary that's being directed by uh, Ron Howard called Idea Man, uh, which is, I'm sure, going to be amazing and very musical, as we all know, Jim Henson, very musical. Uh, David Fleming is going to join the show in just a bit. Um, but we were just talking about before we recorded, Robert, that uh, you know we've, we've heard about the connection before with you and Jim Henson, but um, I'm sure you're really excited about this documentary. There's almost not anyone as universally beloved as Jim Henson, I feel like. There's, you know... Th- it's you would have to get to i don't even know who i mean i think he's arguably more maybe lesser known but more beloved than walt disney in a lot of ways god i think you're right and i can't wait to see first of all to hear david's take on the music because any jim henson documentary is going to be musical top to bottom yeah mana mana ding ding <laughs> you know where do you put score in around a Henson documentary. Yeah, that's I'm what sure, I'm curious about. I'm sure there's going to be opportunities. But, Matt, I think you're right. I think you nailed it. It's almost... I mean, Walt Disney's more famous. Well, I mean, Walt... I'm also talking... You're you're biased because you uh, were involved in the founding, I think, right? Of Henson uh, Records. Yeah. So I, that... I, uh, but, I, and we... so I got... I was in the... It, it, I don't think it was actually in the... You don't say about Henson in the cult. You were so excited to be near that ethos creatively. It was yeah. one of the things that Jim Henson taught me in in his legacy uh, because he died right before I worked at the Henson Company, literally mm-hmm. months before. Um, and so I was brought in to help with the music. But is... He was 101% creative. And if you could be, I mean, it was, I'm going to make funny puppets and have them sing and talk and tell funny stories. And and a truly, every cliche is true, childlike, creative, expressive approach to making things. And all you had to do was go to the puppet shop and see drawers full of noses and eyes <laughs> and yeah. gloves and hats for puppets and you, and it was serious it wasn't like you walked in there and everybody's giggling everybody's in there working really hard on creating so Henson brought to this spirit for creative people of storytelling through puppetry, but just storytelling that was really magical. Yeah, and it's interesting because you mostly just think of the puppets when you think of his name, but like the music and the stories and the characters are, it's more than just the puppets, but it's super it's easy well to forget all of that, which is why I'm excited. And anything Ron Howard is a part of, I mean, oh, his like, Beatles doc, you know, I mean, yep. yeah, that's going to be fantastic. Um, but yeah, we're uh, we're really excited to hear about that and much more. Um, we're going to jump in right now with our interview with composer David Fleming. 
All right, today's guest uh, has collaborated with some big-time pop artists, including Lady Gaga, Elton John, Pharrell, and Beyonce. He's a He's got a number of big projects dropping this year as well, including Damsel, starring Millie Bobby Brown, Alto Nights, starring Robert De Niro, and the Jim Henson documentary, Robert. You're going to be interested in talking about that a little bit, I think, called Idea Man. Uh, he worked with Ron Howard on that. And you can also check out the new series, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, starring Donald Glover, right now on Prime Video. Please welcome David Fleming to the show. What's up, David? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Boy, we're we uh, we're have, glad we to have you. We used to have, have a, a sample of applause. What happened to that? We are really <laughs> falling down on the job. We had that great crowd noise. No, I think holding the applause is good. Some of those projects are still in, uh, you know, they're they're still ongoing. So so let's let's definitely hold the applause. I want to yeah, you... just jump in and ask about the where is Henson finished and in the can? No, 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 no. But it's, uh, you know, I'm I'm constantly knocking on wood, but it's it's getting very very close. Good. So uh, yeah, we're actually just starting to record instrumentalists on the on the score this week. And, uh, but yeah, it's, I'm excited for people to see that. I mean, who doesn't love Jim Henson? It's, it's just, you know, it's just the, the, the easiest, uh, subject to, to kind of engage with because everyone has some sort of feeling about him or his work or, or one of his shows. So, uh, it's been, it's been a real pleasure to work on that. We'll talk. <laughs> um. uh, David, <laughs> we, we've, we've seen your name for years on credits and but this kind of feels like your year you've got all these big projects coming out and it's david fleming composer um but before we get to all of the projects that you have coming up we like to sort of introduce our audience to you maybe get a little backstory on you know how you got to today where you came um, from so yeah 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 can we can we start kind of back in the day where where did you grow can, up and honestly we can start as early as you're comfortable with where where the first kind of seed of a musical you know instinct came from it that you started the chase sure sure i mean yeah it's it's crazy to talk about because in in a lot of ways i feel like i'm just getting going in but you know i've i've been i've been involved with music my whole life and um you know i think like a lot of composers uh you know you had to find out what you were bad at first. And in my case, it was, uh, I was a very undisciplined piano student. And, um, Where? uh, gr I grew up in New York, uh, you know, a little bit North of the city. And, um, and it was, you know, it, it basically forced me to, to find out what I wanted to do. I was always trying to change the pieces and, and, you know, or, or, fi or figure pieces on the radio out. So, so it sort of led me kind of away from, classical piano and and towards playing in bands and things like that and and just mucking around on computers uh it was actually um one of my friends who had like uh, an art project that was she had to do like a fake movie trailer and she asked me to to do music for that and that was kind of my um kind of the start of like oh this is something that feels really specific to me hmm. um I was always obsessed with movies. I worked at a video store all through high school and and uh, just like absorbing those things constantly. Um, and then weirdly, I think like the friend I mentioned was the granddaughter of John Morris, who, you know, did all of Mel Brooks's films. And and I had another friend who's, whose father was a film composer. And it I think it subconsciously started to get in my head that this was an actual profession um which was so far from my family's experience i have uh, i don't have musician parents um uh and so the whole thing seemed kind of ludicrous but um <laughs> were your but, parents supportive of you did they did they see a uh, a promise in you or want you to fulfill this or was that a source of conflict no not at all yeah foolishly they were they were very supportive of the whole endeavor <laughs> um uh but you know um I now like looking back, I see some, even though there weren't musicians, I see some kind of DNA because my, my father is a, a civil engineer and my mother is a literature teacher. And I think there is this mixture of, of like architecture and structure and, and just story sense that was the story sense, especially was really drilled into me. Um, hmm. my mother was, was, uh, 
was was major always like tearing apart my papers and 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 things like that so it was uh it's it, it was pretty deep in there and um and and then in terms of like going forward after that it really was it was just something that's just started to become more and more obvious to me as a as something i was interested in even in the bands i was playing in we were doing like weird concept albums there was always some story related thing and and uh yeah and it just it just started to be to 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 feel like uh sort of unavoidable as a as a, a goal so so as you move forward in this in in this progression i i read in your bio that you started moonlighting as uh, kind of doing advertising and also ringtones, which I find super <laughs> fascinating because yeah. I think there's probably some of our listeners who are listening to the show who don't realize don't that know what it is. you used to pay to have <laughs> your too. phone ring yeah. Yeah. with a polyphonic version of a song and it was like 99 cents. Now everyone just puts their phone on silent, but how did that happen? And, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think that was like a huge booming industry for a minute and then it quickly changed, but what was your process in all of that? Yeah, well, I was a I was an intern at a at a post house in in New York City, and and I think ringtones were kind of where they stuck the interns and and uh, entry level people. Um, and it wasn't even as 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 um, palatable as uh, as a polyphonic version of a song. They were like they were like when they were the little skits, you know. That I don't know if you remember that you'd get like weird voices and things like that. So. They would just send me downstairs to do like five ringtones a day, and and it was really as weird or as random as you could think of. Um, you know, uh, uh, it, the one thing was it got me really quick with like Pro Tools and editing audio, and and also just coming up with ideas on the fly. And they weren't good ideas usually, but <laughs> like I, I think the only <laughs> the only ringtone I I did that that had any sort of impact was. Um, it was at the end of the day and I was like, I, I only have four and I ended up just like looping a bunch of car alarms and that that was the uh <laughs> that was the <laughs> only one that that got major download. So um no, it was it was it, it uh, honestly it's a it's a little bit facetious, but but it but it being in that environment of the post house and pitching for ad advertising and and um and also and just the just dealing with deadlines and, and expectations. It was, it was super valuable to me, um, uh, in, in preparing to do this. Then what was the jump for you? Like going from that into something, you know, a little bit more artistic, uh, and being able to actually exercise your music more. Yeah. Well, I was always doing that on the side. I was, I was always, you know, writing and, and, um, helping friends on short films and things like that. Um, and I ended up winning uh, this um, BMI fellowship, this Pete Carpenter fellowship, to to um, mm. go work with Mike Post for for six weeks. I'm sorry for you. And what's that? I said I'm sorry for you, <laughs> but that's very nice. <laughs> no, How yeah, much I'm... of the Mike Post uh, cues have you written that I'm listening to with Mike Post's name on it? Oh no 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 this this was this was literally just a a shadowing of uh of him that they they BMI used to do um and uh I mean he's he's uh he's an amazing character and 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 honestly he's the one who was kind of like you should be out here um uh you know I had just come out for for this little fellowship and and Mike was super encouraging and uh at the same time like very brutally honest of like just just be ready for it to all fail but you should you should you should try and and he's the kind of guy who when he says something it's his the tone of his voice i don't know it just it just makes you ready to jump so uh so that's what i ended up doing so did you ever go back uh to mike no to to new york or did you oh. just stay oh, or like to what, new york was... no no, no. I've, I've been out there i've been out here since yeah uh, i um i ended up I ended up meeting uh, Otley Orverson, who was a former protege of of Mike, and won that same contest I had. Uh, and and he um, he needed an assistant, and that's kind of how I ended up at Remote Control, a place where I always wanted to end up, but had no idea how that was going to happen, and it happened in a really random sort of way. 
Well, yeah, we have we to, we have so to ask many... about that random way then. How how did it come together? Well, just that. I mean, I was I, Otley was Otley was at remote control. He was he was um, you know he was already sort of in a in his burgeoning career, but he was also uh, contributing to Hans's projects and um, and he needed an assistant. So I was he he you know Otley really was my my sort of entryway into the into the business and and uh, you know a major mentor for me as well. Got it. What was the the growth like in that? So you come into remote control, you're an assistant, um, and then are is it slowly like a little more leash? Can you walk us through like how you develop into now you're you're writing stuff, you're getting projects, maybe that you know that there's there's too many things, and now we got it. David, let's let's give David a shot at this. Like when was that moment for you? Yeah, I don't know if it's a single moment and it's it it honestly if you were to look at those years it would just be like and put them in fast motion it would just be me you know going back and forth to to the studio in my bed in Santa Monica you know and sometimes not even getting home to my bed it was it was it, there's nothing glamorous about about you know the story of 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 that it's it's really just slowly sort of getting opportunities started uh you know writing for Otley and then writing for other people around um I did uh, you know a lot of work uh with Steve Jablonski and some with mm. Lorne and Tom Holkenberg so it was it was it was kind of just um yeah there it, it was a just a series of sleepless nights that added up to uh some sort of result and But um, I got to think that being next to those composers in the throes of whatever project they were on it's just you know that's you're kind of very modestly saying this is the experience that everyone dreams of getting next to junkie xl while he's working on something or jablonski while he's working on something or otley you know that is there's a line all the way to the horizon of all those usc berkeley miami perspiring young composers who would literally kill to be in your yeah. chair for those experiences I and learn the tricks of all those composers that you can now bring forward for your projects. Absolutely. I mean, you know, um, I think sometimes there is a, some people don't, don't feel, you know, they want to skip the, the assistant route or, or they want to get right ahead to their own careers. I, I, um, I found it incredibly invaluable to to be around these guys and and to see how they handle not just things musically but but the business and meetings and to be in those meetings and it was um yeah a- absolutely invaluable and and I as to this day from each one of them I I I could tell you things you know that I I grabbed from 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 each of them that I, that I continue to use, and some of them are subconscious, and some of them are some of them are conscious. So, um, yeah, absolutely, that was that was major for me. And and then the other interesting thing was all of them essentially had, uh, you know, had gone through Hans in mm-hmm. some way, and and I was sort of for a long time getting this like um, a lot of like pass through wisdom in a way mm. from from Hans but I had never uh I you know I was always on the peripheral but I had never worked with him and then um and then uh I sort of had dipped my toe in, in the water with him uh, on a couple things and then he ended up asking me to to work on Blue Planet and that that started the relationship with him which um uh you know now has has been uh, like six years or something like that. Was that just an email? What? What's? How does that <laughs> message get delivered? Because that's kind of a pivotal moment for you, I imagine. Yeah, I think it was a call. I remember being at the movie theater and having to walk out of the movie and 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 get a call. Um, hmm. uh, but, but honestly, it was probably just uh, just a series of of little conversations that I had with him and 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 things going all right when I was, when I was close by, you know, and, uh, and uh, again, maybe I'm sort of, you know, 
making it sound like less than it was. There were there 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 were projects, and there were and there were um, you know lots of getting to know each other in that way. But but it was kind of you know talk about like what you dream of. You know I <laughs> I I, uh, I I'm pretty careful not to not to be a fan in front of Hans because I want you know. You, you don't like the E Street band. You don't like, I'm sure they're not like going and telling Bruce that he's their favorite songwriter, but, uh, you know, he was, <laughs> he's a, a, a big hero of mine. And, uh, and so I don't take it lightly that I've been able to, um, to learn from him and, um, and, you know, help him hopefully and, 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 you know, get to collaborate on a lot of projects as co composers as well. I know Steve said that Steve Jablonski had a very similar experience as that where he was like, Hans is just like my, he's like my, my hero in this industry right now. So just the idea that at some point I might be able to work for him and then at some point with him and then at some point, you know, maybe be kind of inspired by a little bit of what, he, you know, I, I grew up with um, is super cool. I've always thought that that's, uh, did we, um, I know we were shooting our documentary around 2015, 2016. Did we cross paths with you at all at Remote Control? I was, I think I was out of remote control at that point. Okay. I was, I had a studio down the street and <clears throat> weirdly, of course, like that's when Hans starts to call and he's like, <laughs> Hey, yeah. you, I think you should come back. I think, you know, um, <laughs> he missed you. Yeah. You know, and it was, I, I, I did come back, but you know, not without trepidation because it's like a, it's a daunting, um, thing to, to consider like, you know, what if this doesn't go well? And, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm so happy I did. And, and I feel so lucky to have, to, you know, worked on so many projects with him. You just, I wanted to ask you the first couple swings you took with Hans were, what was going through your mind? Were you nervous? And, and did they land? Did you get notes? Like that must be very, very, a vulnerable situation for you to go through and, and either succeed or get notes and go back at it. Like, what was that process for you? Um, yeah, I'm sure it was like, I was racked with terror. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, presenting music to, to anyone, let alone Hans Zimmer is, is always, <laughs> you know, an anxiety inducing experience. Uh, you know, whether it be a filmmaker or, or just like my friend down the hall, like, what do you think of this? So, so I'm, I'm positive that I, that I was, I was nervous. Um, I can't remember what a first one was or anything like that, but you know, it, it, it tended to go pretty well. Or if it, you know, if, it, if there was a dud, it was always for a good reason. I've never, I've never, um, ha walked away from Hans, uh, thinking that he was wrong about something. Uh, uh, like everything, even, even if at the time I'll, I've ever disagreed with a note he's given it, it's like usually at the end of the day, I'm like, ah, that was, that was dead on. So, yeah. um, uh, so no, I mean, it's, it's all, it's all, I always, I always come, come away with something from him. And also, you know, the major thing, which is that, um, you know, good isn't good enough for him, which is, which it, mm. it's kind of the same for me. So it's, it's like, there's all, it, it always could be better. And, you know, that's an inspiring energy to, to be around. You reminded me of two things that are kind of essential aspects of a life in the entertainment business. In reverse order, you said, you know, I moved away, and then, of course, I was invited back. That is right. a very old experience of many of us, including me, that the minute, for example, I moved to Los Angeles from New York City, I instantly got more work in New York City than I'd ever gotten. Right. And was now based in L.A., flying back to my hometown for work, and months at a time, and it was a little bit of, why couldn't you have done this while I lived here? But I think, <laughs> yeah. there's, a, I think there's a trope that is, I don't know if, you know, it feels too poetic to say, well, they miss you, or you move away, and they suddenly realize you're gone. It's just when you said it, you moved out, and suddenly that's when he said, "Of course, come back." I thought, mm, "Yeah, welcome to it." The yeah. other thing that I haven't really thought about or acknowledged 
By the way, fellas, I'm listening to David, but I'm editorializing. I'm just, I'm narrating the conversation, <laughs> the kind of <laughs> meta issues that are coming up. <laughs> Is when you said through, through Steve Jablonski or Junkie XL or Otley, you were getting Hans's approach as a pass through. It's right. a little bit like kind of Renaissance artists. Mm. You know, I didn't. I didn't study with Bernini, the sculptor, but I studied with his student right. and learned the technique. And I thought, wow, with composers. And certainly Hans has spawned this unbelievable generation, not only of immediate knock-on effect of Harry, Powell, et cetera, but you think, okay, Germain is worked with John Powell, mm-hmm. who was under Hans, and I... I never have asked Jermaine, are you using a Hans Zimmer approach by a pass-through? Or David worked with Steve Jablonski, who worked with, and I thought, isn't that wonderful that Hans Mm. has sort of done something? And I'm sure Hans isn't alone. I think that, you know, Chris Bacon worked with James Newton Howard, and I'm sure Chris Bacon has an assistant, or the folks that work around Christoph Beck, and then pass on even as you said, unconsciously, you know, mm-hmm. just a technique for how to tune horns. Right. I think it's wonderful, and I just love the fact that you kind of acknowledge the pass through. I'm finished. Please continue your conversation. <laughs> what, well, no, no, it's funny I, you you talk about that because it, it makes me wonder, as someone who's coming in, who's like the younger guy coming out of a different side of the country. What do you bring to them? Are you mm. showing them new things? Because oh, I wonder great. if there's something about them using the new guard to stay fresh. I know in every other industry that's the case. Like young people come in with new ideas and you collaborate. But did you notice that you were maybe be showing them something that they were learning from you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, m- maybe... You know, I know with with Otley uh, specifically because we had the closest working relationship. I I think he he relied on on me to sort of um, keep the production uh, modern and and honestly, I think remote control in general has, you know, to to your point, Robert, it has, it has sort of had generations come through, and and I think the sound sort of gets updated as well so Mm. i i i I think commonly i think commonly production is like the obvious thing that that um young people bring not only be because it relies on technology and technology is changing quickly but also i think because usually when you get your foot in the door at least it was for me your your first your first assignments are not like write a theme you know, it's, it's, how do you, can you, can you blow this out? Can you make the sound great? Can you make the sound fantastic? So I think, I think it sort of naturally leads to, to, um, to production being kind of the first thing that, that younger generations add. Um, but you know, in some ways it's not, it's not for me to say what, what I've brought, um, to them. It's like, it's hard for me to even know, to be honest, but, but, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, I think as you, as you listen to the chain, you know, to, to film music changing in general, that, that, you know, it's obvious, it's just, it's just obvious that, um, newer generations are, are, have a new perspective. And, and a lot of it is, is, is quite honestly from watching the movies that the previous generation made and, and kind of having our own interpretation of it. Have you ever, had the feeling i mean that's really nice i haven't while you were speaking i wasn't thinking musically that's interesting because of course we see evolutionarily Mm. you know with all due respect to remote and all that our good friend daniel pemberton kind of blew my mind with spider verse and hilder on the you know using the sounds of a nuclear abandoned mm-hmm. nuclear plant for the Chernobyl yeah. score, you know, which is now two or three years ago or five years ago. You know, these were transcendent moments in the evolution of film scoring, but I was thinking you, you were saying that I wonder if the younger folks come in, there's a technological, oh, you're still using, this is a bad example, Cubase, mm-hmm. 
you know, have you tried Ableton? Oh, yeah. you're still using that approach to EQ or sampling or waveforms. I've found that I wonder if you ever had that experience of either the maestro Zimmer or anybody you're working with going, dude, how'd you figure that out? Or where, <laughs> how'd you do that? where did you learn that? That is a, because I think I'm finding that all the time, of course, yeah. it, which is I work with somebody who's 24 years old and they say, I say, how would you do this? And boom, they do it in a second. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. Oh, native digital approach that I'm right. Well, that yeah, that's just it. It's like it's it's like the they speak a different language, or you know, I even think like I you know I'm someone who remembers the internet starting, but you know I I'm encountering this generation coming in who was born into it, you know, and it's like a it's it it feels much more native and in, in, in the way they they deal with it, but. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, I I think, you know, also like just playing playing non-film music for each other, uh, mm. you know, is something I've always done with other composers, just like Great trying to idea. find out what other people are listening to. But but the to go back to your point about things passing through, I I think the main thing um that has passed through at least in my experience uh, if we're talking about Hans is is not musical it's it's like a, a an approach to filmmaking and and i think that informed those people that i started with and and is definitely informed me which is that be a filmmaker first um and not uh, a composer trying to impose his will onto the onto the picture it's like it's it really get on the other side of the table with the filmmakers and and it's you know it's it's such a different process than if you're trying to defend your work. And that is the, that is the Hans Zimmer mantra that we have all learned, which is you are a filmmaker and storyteller with them. And you're pointing in the direction they want to go as opposed to I'm a musician and an artist and I'm going to apply my musicianally artistically yeah how's this going to play in a, in a car by itself yeah. like that's not that's the so focus. wonderful david for you to to express that it's i mean it's definitely fun to to feel like it it can stand on, on its own too and I, and I think that's important but 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 it's why i'm interested in it it's like i said it, it was it was i was obsessed with movies and, and storytelling since i was a kid so um uh yeah the other way doesn't interest me too much you know i mean i think i've told this story now exactly I, i've counted i think it's 11 billion times on this podcast what i the conversation i had with hans probably 20 years ago when i said i don't know which we were working on and i said something like you know i figured out that one of the mistakes that young composers make is that it's it's like 20% music, 80% politics. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, I think it's kind of a third, a third, a third. Really, what's the other third? Well, it's a third music, a third politics, but a third storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, I, wow, you're right. That's, I hadn't even kind of, I'd assume that's a given, but it's really not. No. And and you, what you don't realize is w- once you get in there, there are certain people who can't tell the story in music, which is okay. You can be a great guitar player, or a great rock songwriter. By the way, on this screen is somebody who's not good at telling stories with music. Me, I can write songs, but the idea of scoring and being fluid m- musically around the narrative, I just found I wasn't good at that. That wasn't mm. organic for me. Right. Um, I thought in terms of A A B A, and maybe there's an eight bar release. I grew up <laughs> writing songs and loved that. And yeah. instead of beating myself up about it, I just had to accept that. But Hans was really saying the job of the film composer is narrative. Right. And that's just, I don't know if they teach that in the music schools. Maybe they do. Yeah, they 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 should. I mean, like uh, 
and, and my school, I, I really think there's a missed opportunity to get together with like the film classes and have, and have you take film classes as well, you know, not just music classes. And I, where was I, that? Cause we're going to start the David Fleming Institute of film <laughs> music classes. Uh, I was at a uh, SUNY purchase. Uh, Lovely. Uh, yeah. So, um, and it was a great, it was a great program, but, uh, uh, and more importantly, a state school, so I wasn't in crippling debt um, uh, starting this career. Um, but um, but yeah, no, I think I think there were great filmmakers, and and I always regretted that I didn't um, or or sort of wasn't in, wasn't in the position to to take more film classes and to to be more involved. It's literally that. you're articulating the conversation I've had with every music school ever. Why yeah. don't you have the filmmaking and art department in? Yep. I'm going to come and talk to the music students about yep. scoring. Definitely. But they want to know, you know, if, if it's a minor sixth, does that make it m more spooky? It's like, I don't know, sort of, maybe, yes. Depends on what the <laughs> vibe is. But why don't we have the filmmakers in here to talk about where the spotting would take place. That's a really interesting yeah. conversation with a filmmaker and a composer. When are you starting the cue and when yes. are you getting out? But it was always on deaf ears. They think, well, the film students have their thing and yeah. we're in the music department. Yeah. So I'd yeah. love uh, that should be done more, what you just described. Well, when when you start that institute, I'll <laughs> come there. <laughs> Do it. The Fleming Institute with your millions <laughs> yeah. from... Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you're going to... There we go. There, and that, what a transition that was, Robert. That's what we want to talk Thank about now, so Mr. and Mrs. Smith. And it's interesting because we talked with uh, Ludwig a couple years ago on the show mm -hmm. about working with Donald Glover in a pop world yeah. and you know writing songs and, and such. But Donald Glover is also an incredible filmmaker, actor, mm -hmm. and you're working with him on this show. I'm wondering what that collaboration is like musically because... He's a very musical guy. What, how, how involved was he in your score for the show? Well, it, you know, incredibly in, involved in that he really like kind of threw the gauntlet out, which was not a, a, a very specific musical assignment. In fact, almost terrifyingly non-specific musically. However, he told me exactly what he wanted the show to to feel like, which is, you know. They they wanted it to be a big and exciting show when it was appropriate and acknowledged the genre, the sort of spy aspect when appropriate, but never in an obvious way. He 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 said, you know, to him, the show was about trust um, and it really was about the the relationship at the center. So, you know, it it, it became about like, well, how do we, you know, relationships when they start, it's it's there's a lot of espionage going on anyway. It's, it's like, what, what do I tell this person? What are they not telling me? And, and, um, so, you know, it, the show really focuses on that. And, uh, and I, I wanted the music to, to kind of fit both storylines as well. And, um, and the other thing is Donald and also Francesca, uh, Fran Francesca Sloan, the, the showrunner, they were, super encouraging of like go embrace the weird choices you know mm -hmm. they they always were game to hear something strange and a little offbeat and because the you know when people see the show they'll see that it's like a there's a lot of idiosyncrasy to this mr and mrs smith and 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 there's a lot of like relatably awkward moments and they're they're not slick they're not in control so um, you know, the score wasn't being asked to be those things either. It, it, mm. it, uh, which, which actually ended up, you know, making it really, really fun once you realize like that governor was off. Did you go back and watch the film? No, I or listen to Powell. I did. I certainly did not. I, I, I specifically chose not to. I mean. I've seen like Donald and Maya out there being like, we're not Brad Pitt. We're not Angelina Jolie. I want to add to that. I am not John Powell. <laughs> and, um, but this was like a totally different take on the story. Mm. It's almost, the premise is almost opposite. And, mm. and the, the focus is really on like a relatable, non superhuman, um, 
you know, couple who is just trying to figure out this work romance balance. Um, so, you know, because of that, I didn't want to watch the original movie, which had a much different take and, and, and be influenced in any way by, by the movie or the score. Plus, I'm like a huge admirer of John Powell's and um, Who isn't? I don't know, you know, something about listening to one of his scores in preparation for my own feels like a masochistic endeavor, you know. <laughs> well, I can tell you that uh, I'll just, when you get a little older, I can share with you what happened on that set. Because mm. I was privy to, it was, oh, it was filmed on stage 14 of the Fox lot. And... Uh, was that you, Robert, leaking things to uh, National Enquirer? Well, I don't know if you remember <laughs> that during that show, there was a huge, do you know? There was, I mean, there was a huge yeah. kerfuffle, a yeah. romantic kerfuffle. Mm -hmm. And strangely enough, I was privy to walking on to the set one day. Oh, boy. And see, <laughs> We'll leave it at that. And seeing something <laughs> that... Um, I realized if I wanted another source of income, I could go to the National Enquirer <laughs> right now. So we'll just leave it at that. Let's talk about uh, Kermit and Piggy. I think that's far sure. more. He's not confirming or denying. No, real uh, quick, though, can you no. kind of explain your musical choices for the score uh, for those who haven't heard it yet since the show's mm -hmm. so new? Yeah, I mean, I've never... Um, well, first, let me just say that like I've never thought about an audience perspective as much than on this show um you know usually you're you're very wrapped up in thinking about the filmmakers and 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 how to service their vision there was like an additional layer of partially because of 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 kind of the original assignment it was like let's make it exciting let's make it uh let's make it kind of uh crazy and offbeat it was like really led by my fun barometer a lot of the time in a way that you know it's like sometimes structure went out the door in we i felt like we had like a lot more a lot more license to be irreverent and cheeky at times and mm -hmm. and so you know in terms of the sound of the show it's it's like um the filmmakers were really gravitating towards like uh, towards things that fell more in the synth world. Um, I mean, at first, I was just trying everything. There was there was a very short amount of time to to sort of define the sound and and get the show done. So it was like the first episode was just like throwing everything at it and seeing what stuck. And they seemed to gravitate towards a lot of a lot of synthetic elements. But I also wanted to kind of um, have something that felt a little older or, or almost like as if you were to uh, go into the basement and find a bunch of old soundtracks from the seventies mm. or pop songs from the sixties, Italian, Italian songs. And, and if you were to take, you know, find all this great vinyl and sample it, that kind of became wow, cool. the approach, which was like essentially to create our own samples. Um, not meaning like a like a like a contact sample instrument, but like literally, uh, oftentimes you know playing improv takes and just finding little bits, and um, even on the synthesizers, which usually are like, you know, that's the last thing you do is perform them live. Almost everything was performed live, even the percussion on synths, and and just taking little bits and treating them as if, you know, we were making like a pop record and using and using old old samples so that well if you listen to childish gambino records you're describing exactly his style which is it's very it sounds classic it sounds like something that came out in the 70s almost at times i think that probably informs a lot of what he does including the show which is which is there is something you know it's a twist it's a twist on something classic and it's not trying to it's not trying to destroy the old thing. It's 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 it actually, in a way, strengthens strengthens it by approaching it, it just in in such a different way. So, um, yeah, you know, I it felt it felt very it always felt very informed by Donald and Maya, like the way they interacted and and their their characters. So, um, 
so yeah, it ended up being this this kind of crazy mishmash of of sounds um, that you know I didn't I tried not to like think about too much or over conceptualize at times and just be like, what is the most fun, exciting thing? I I I personally I you know I I hear film film composers talk a lot and sometimes it gets so conceptual and so serious. I'm just dying for more people to be like, this is just so much fun. And I just did what was the most fun thing, you know, what was the most exciting and engaging thing. So you Not mentioned the huge obstacle there though, which is the amount of time that you had, how much time did you have to try to inject <laughs> things that you were saying, Hey, this could be really fun. Sometimes the deadlines aren't quite yeah. uh, playing ball. Yeah, we had eight weeks for the eight episodes, um, but that includes, oh, like, gosh. making the sound of the show. Um, but, like, that sounds bad, but weirdly it sounds when it's... pretty stressful. When it's that little time, it it created a really... Um, it was like a really playful dynamic because also it it wasn't... It was that coupled with the filmmakers saying, go for it, not being like... Uh, like, are we going to get it done? They weren't fearful, um, especially after they heard, you know, the first episode. It was just like, it was just go for it. So weirdly, what ended up happening was no time for second guessing, no time for waffling and, and being insecure. It was just like, just go and be instinctual um, and... Um, and have a great team as well, which I do. And, and, you know, it's, we, we talked a lot about, you know, coming up with teams, uh, at remote control and, and mm. it's a dynamic I, I love and, and embrace and, and, and I'm lucky to, to have great people to work with. Let's see. I think we know why you have, you have four, four projects going cause you called an eight week deadline playful. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, it, it it definitely took precedence for those for those eight weeks, but but it it I would have called it something else. That's terrifying. No, but yeah, but, this, but this like I say, it's 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 it eliminates it eliminates second guessing, which yeah, which no, that's when it's having a having that true deadline is definitely a a, a blessing at times because you can't yeah. sit there and and I've been and I've, I've been in worse situations, <laughs> so it's it's uh uh it's 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 something that you you know. So some people kind of do okay with. Sorry, do, Robert, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that um, I'll be interested to hear it because I don't know how deep you went down this path, but the 70s approach to film scoring, just to make you really nervous, can either be <laughs> cool if it's kind of contemporized, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's funny in that it's almost a comment that's tacky on a on action because there is a mm. kind of 70s tv cop show vibe that if first of all if you hear it in a genuine you know i don't know what those channels are that play old time tv series right. but you hear it and you think oh, that's so funny that kind of oh we're gonna sound like the kids today uh but we're gonna keep a cue in there while the 1970 dodge polaris races right. down the street or i guess there's a way to make it sound cool i don't know what that is because it always sounds kind of tacky did you use genuine 70s like dragnet or manix <laughs> or one of those <laughs> no, no 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 <clears throat> yeah i mean saying 70s is, is okay is casting like a really uh, that's too large a net one of the um, worst tv music <clears throat> periods eras R right <laughs> well i mean you know ac a lot of that came from uh francesca uh being inspired by <clears throat> movies films from the 70s um and a lot of foreign films as well a lot of european films um i weirdly like the one reference point i'm remembering <clears throat> excuse me is i i started listening to like some pop stuff that ennio morricone had done like before he so that which is actually sixties, um, but mm. um, uh, where he was, he acted as an arranger for for some pop music. And Italian pop music is at least the stuff I've consumed is like super dramatic and and cinematic and and um, and I think he kind of considered them t 
to be pretty low, but I, I there's something really charming about about mm, it. Nice. And and there and there's also it also the show sort of shifts uh, in, in different episodes because uh, you know it starts out in New York and there's like a grittiness to it and and uh, and a lot of a lot of synth, a lot of propulsive rhythm. And then they start to go abroad and there's a couple episodes uh uh, in Italy, where uh, the filmmakers were like, "This is where we can be a little, a little cheeky," and, oh, that's and we nice. can, and so then it's legit. I definitely, I definitely took it too far uh, <laughs> uh, on on a draft or two, but um, but it was nice to have to have that opportunity because it does get a little bit more more bond uh in in appearance in in those hmm. in those moments and we never went there with the music but it's but it was like it's it's a it's a license to to uh be a little more romantic and a little uh just a little bit more playful i don't know if you've seen the film and just to put a button on it may december i haven't i haven't yet where no. todd haynes actually adapts a a score from I think the sixties or seventies and has and forgive me, I've forgotten the composer of because that because it's really you're listening to like Michelle Legrand's score from a very that's famous sixties right. film that's been adapted for certain scenes. I and heard about that, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna kind of resist my opinion, but it's been shared by a lot of people that it's quizzical we'll leave it at that to mm. use a kind of 60s sound <laughs> mm -hmm. over a very contemporary story yeah and w i think the danger is it it's like instead of watching the movie i'm thinking why is he why, do why is he that? putting that cue in yeah. there that sounds like it's a dramatic romance of another era and wow that's not what i was thinking for the scene right. in the kitchen um right it's right <laughs> so it's it's just curious and it it's also a really good lesson in thinking about the way that music completely changes the way you're looking at the story oh absolutely i mean i i haven't seen that i it's a very from, good movie really yeah. good but that those cues are odd sorry from what I heard about those cues, I, I we we don't do anything like that in this in this show. It's it's um, it's much more couched in the personality of the of the, the rest of the score. But, um, I will say, uh, not to push back on it because I haven't seen it, but there part of what I was um, thinking about when I was considering the audience perspective was my own um the way i consume television and uh mm. and, and media especially television uh these days because i think this show like a lot of my favorite shows kind of the tone is is not consistent and it's not mm. um it's i think it's pers uh, purposefully a, a blend and and i think at least i have gotten very comfortable with that idea of this of this this tonal structure that's not traditional and 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 oftentimes what i was what i was thinking while working on the show is you know sometimes when you're working on a movie you want to establish like a very strict architecture and say like well this is the correct thing to do this is the correct thing to do when i'm watching a show and i i i, I don't know if this would apply to the to the scene you're thinking of but sometimes when something is is so like um, arresting. Um, it, it's, it, it, I think about it a lot afterwards and maybe I decide it was a bad choice or maybe I decided it was a good choice, but, but it being arresting is, is something I, 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 I started thinking about a lot in terms of the choices I was making scoring this show of like, well, this, this would be the correct thing to do, but what would be mm. exciting if I was the audience right now? And, and, and when I, when I consume media like what what gets my attention and or not at the risk of 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 seeming wrong but but just like ooh you know because i i feel like there's there's so much to watch and there's so much to listen to that that um well it sounds uh, like that opens the door to all kinds of experiments some of which are probably 
brilliant and some of them that are probably you know you wouldn't ever want someone else to hear them yeah absolutely and there's plenty of those i have but um <laughs> I, I, but no i mean i think that's uh, you know that's what i've always enjoyed doing and honestly like not to not to go back to hans but it's it's something that that is fun to be around him for because because he 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 tries to to make things um new and and fresh and he doesn't he doesn't go back to the well so um so yeah that that really at least informed my thought process whether or not it, it informed the final I result. think going back to Hans is a perfect circular point for this discussion because it kind of begins there and ends there for all of us um I can share that when I did a picture called Broken Arrow with Hans <laughs> uh 9011 years ago with John Travolta and Christian Slater. Slater and her name escapes me, but I can see her clearly. And it was John Woo, which was really cool. And Hans, I kind of mentioned it to him, and he said, yeah, I want to work with John Woo, and I'll do it. And he accurately looked at the picture. Maybe there was temp music, and we looked at it together, and he said, it's kind of a cool Western. I thought, mm -hmm. what a great insight. I didn't. Mm. Yeah. You know, if they're going to get a nuclear, John Travolta is going to save the world by defusing something or one of those things. And it was in the Utah underneath the mountains with a bomb factory or whatever happens. And Han said, it's like, you want to hear that kind of Dwayne Eddy guitar <laughs> from like surf guitar. I said, that's right. a cool idea. And he said, no, really, let's find <laughs> Dwayne Eddy. <laughs> I said, I mean, it, I don't even. P.S. If I told you that about four days later, Dwayne Eddy, who lived in like Hollywood, Florida, right, is in remote control with a Fender light blue Mustang guitar, you know, some 60s relic that he played all these hits on. And he's sitting there going, like it's like. But a little down, 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 <laughs> you know, like an Ennio Morricone thing. But yeah. I thought, Hans, you are the maestro of maestros. You not only had a sound in your head, but you actually, because I think my default was always, we can find a session guy. Let's get Dean Parks or George Deering to bring in, you know, 11,000 guitars to the date, and we'll put a little vibrato on it, and he'll mimic the surf sound. Hans's approach was, Let's find the guy. Get the guy. And bring him yeah, here. I, I had almost exactly the same experience with him, <clears throat> which was uh, at the beginning of COVID, uh, we were scoring Ron Howard's Hillbilly Elegy together. And uh, we were supposed to go to Nashville and record strings. And, and obviously that went out of the door really quickly. And we had to kind of pivot. And we were talking about guitars. And I was exactly where you were. Like, um, you know, let's let's get a session guy who can just crush it. <laughs> and he said, what about Derek Trucks? And I said, yeah, yes. Like it was, it was, you know, and of, of course he, uh, Derek wasn't touring at the time and he ended up adding this like third dimension to the score, which was fantastic. And it's something, it's, it's a conversation I remember so, so clearly because I, it was, it was literally that first week of COVID and I just finished watching once upon a time in the West, hmm. he called me. So what, and it, it just felt like, all right, like let's go on an adventure. And it's something that I try to think about now with my own projects is like, I always think about that interaction and like, well, make it an adventure, cast the right guy, bring in the right person, you know, make it the right sound. Um, and, and again, honestly, you know, you could say it's, it's, it's exactly the right sound but I think a lot of that is also informed by by what I was talking about, about like, th wouldn't this be fun? Wouldn't this be fun? Wouldn't this oh, be hilarious yeah. to That's do? So nice. And, and I think, um, I don't know, more and more I, I, I go back to that idea and, and like, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be just doing your homework, you know, it can be like, 
you can make a, a, so a, a great. you're allowed to love it. making music yeah yes. oh, <laughs> yeah. that's so nice man that's really yeah. beautiful i think there's a third aspect to it too which i it took me a while to learn um which is you said the word casting i think there's yeah. a, two parts of casting the right player and i really i learned it fundamentally on another movie which is first well you get the Derek Trucks or Dwayne Eddy, you get an authentic sound that a session guy might be able to come close to or even convince the entire audience that's what it should be. But the other knock-on effect of that, which is really precious to great filmmakers who cast a certain way or great composers who cast their band a certain way, is... I don't have to figure this out and have it sound like my idea of what it should be. I get mm. to bring Dwayne Eddy in, and he actually comes up with the sound and the idea. In a way, it's not only a relief, it's you're truly collaborating. I'm going to just share, before we wear you out anymore, that on Walk the Line, T-Bone Burnett did this exact same thing. He wanted Spooner Oldham to play piano, who lives in Franklin, Tennessee, or wherever it was. And it was, wait a minute, man, I can get, you know, Randy Kerber lives in right. West Hollywood and is like the greatest session guy. I want Spooner Oldham. And I want whoever it was on bass, Roscoe Beck, I think he wanted. We're going to fly him in. I thought, this is expensive and weird you know i think i also was i'm the studio guy at that point thinking this right. is going to be difficult and expensive how 100 percent right was t-bone burnett in casting that band and he put a yeah. band together that for all those johnny cash songs was so great and authentic and full of life that studio cats would say you know i think we take a 10 now and we'll be back and and this was a very different experience. Yep. Um yep. and I learned it's worth going that extra mile. And I think you're right. It's fun too. Because oh. those sessions were a blast. Yep. And it also helps to be Hans. Oh uh, yeah, that's that, <laughs> right. that, that goes all our listeners set. are like, Oh, I can just call you know <laughs> when, you, when you have to make that call. But you know, sometimes Hans who is on the phone? But, Go ahead. But my feeling about uh, you know, after talking to Derek is like a lot of these guys are, are kind of, he's, you know, one of the greatest guitarists in the world. And he, he was like a little bit not intimidated is the wrong word, but like apprehensive about how does it, how does this going to work? And, and honestly, I think, yes, there is a bit of like, well, it helps to be Hans making that call. But also I think probably those calls are easier to make than many people realize um, huh. that people want people do want to be involved and and especially if you can share why you're passionate about this film or what what the score is and why you need them i think i think usually people just assume like we we can't call them you know you're so, so right i yeah. mean can somebody call eddie van halen yeah sure no really <laughs> call eddie van yeah. halen yeah and he comes over and says i'll play on a move I'll, what you want me to play on daredevil that sounds yeah. so cool what yeah. when and yeah. you're right. It's you always assume they're too busy and too cool. To to wrap things up, you mentioned that you know Mr. and Mrs. Smith. The tone's always changing. If if Atlanta is any sign of that, I mean, I watch a lot of Donald Glover stuff, so I'm very excited to watch this series, and uh, we're excited to hear your music as well. I mean, I I imagine it's gonna be big, man. We're really excited for you. Good man. Yeah, I'm excited for everyone to see, and uh, yeah, it's it's uh, hopefully it's it's. It's just like a fun experience for everyone to watch, and and no one has to go back to John Powell's score and give me notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all and, about. And best of luck with all of the other projects coming up as well. Um, we touched them on a little Thank bit, you. but uh, really the can't wait Jim Henson those. doc. Uh, Damsel, which is on Netflix, right, with Millie Bobby Brown. Yeah, yeah, that's that's going to be yeah, it's like a big fantasy orchestral thing, complete opposite of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So uh, I'm excited <laughs> nice. for people to see that too. Very it's cool. Awesome. We'll have to check back in with you later this year and and check on that as well. Uh, David Fleming, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. A quick reminder to our listeners: you can follow us 
uh, on X, Score the Podcast. Facebook and Instagram is at Score Movie. And you can watch these episodes for free as well on our YouTube page at Epic Left Media. David Fleming, congratulations, man. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, it's out now on Prime Video. Go check it out. Thanks so much, guys.